Brady Quinn, who joins the show from Two Pros and a Cup of Joe, a show that, well, I work with him as as uh, as I do on this show, just uh, kind of a caddy. I make sure that they pull out the right, uh, you know, the right what what is that called the the what are you using in golf what what's that term what clubs clubs Word. damn there it is there it is the, yeah. the right clubs out of the golf bag uh what's going on man how you doing huh? welcome to the show not much guys uh glad to be on uh, it's been a long time coming yeah, I, I don't know if you guys know this. i've been asking lavar for an opportunity to come on for a while so i appreciate the opportunity <laughs> oh, um man. you know it's 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 funny you know everyone wants to make uh, this settlement you know, act like it's going to be life changing, and, and how we're we're you know spending the dollars now uh, with the rev share for the student athletes. And here's the interesting thing from the sound that you just played from Pete Thamel is with ba- a baseball program right now, right? They're limited with how many scholarships they currently have, but you know the what happen what happens now with with NIL is a lot of these guys who maybe are getting a portion of their scholarships funded by financial aid. Right, they're on they're on a partial scholarship. The rest is financial aid. Some of that can be supplemented now with, with NIL. And so, for a lot of the Olympic sports or the sports outside of the big three, meaning football, men's, women's, basketball, what they've been doing to add talent to their rosters in those sports is they've been funding NIL just to pay for it. Now, the mm. hard thing is they're doing that in football, Brady. Out. They're doing that. In, I know. I'm not even going to throw them out there like this, but I know it some schools like that to. said. We have no scholarships left, but we have X amount NIL. He can pay for yep. school, and he'll have a couple hundred grand, for, you know, for himself. That's what they're doing yep. also. They run out of scholarships. Yeah. We have this huge NIL deal, pay for school, and you have this money for yourself. Exactly. And, and so, but, but here's the one caveat to that. A lot, a lot of people know is, it, it, you know, because obviously the, the scholarships and those other sports only go so far, and then they have financial aid, and if they can't qualify for financial aid, you know, they have the NIL as a backstop. The problem is, is if you make more than three thousand dollars a year, and you are on a partial scholarship, you could get some of your financial aid taken away. Mm. And so that, that's fine, I guess. Uh, but it's, it's going to, you know, dip into that NIL uh, war chest a little bit more so. But look, as of right now, I know it feels like the wild, wild west with college sports and and how we're, we're looking at the settlement and, and players now getting being a part of at least the rev share. Uh, I don't think we're done, uh, in part because of Title IX. And you heard them talk about that and just the difficulties of, I mean, Title IX is law. And so they're gonna have, there's going to have to be law passed by the federal government that's going to allow and protect universities to decide how they want to go about allocating the funding to student-athletes that they're going to be receiving. And, and, so, and then right now, one of the biggest concerns is there's no one really fighting for the women's sports for it to be a 50-50 split. I think most schools right now, if you look at them, just trying to survive by, you know, moving conferences and going to conferences where they've got a more lucrative TV deal, you know, that's kind of where we're at right now. No one's really thinking about trying to be, you know, fair or equitable to men's and women's sports. They're just trying to think about how they can survive for the foreseeable future and be competitive. When, when, when you look at the ruling and do what pitfalls – so what do you see that may be down the road that nobody is talking about? I, I don't know that no one's talking about. I mean, I, I would say right now the, the, the question marks surrounding the collectives is what interests me the most because I think everyone's you know, looking at this and, and thinking that you know, these schools are going to be able to operate with some sort of cap, if you will, with what they're all getting. Uh, almost uh, almost similar to what we see in the NFL, where everyone's got a salary cap, and that's how they're constructing the roster. But the, the collectives are going to be still out there providing opportunities uh, unless they just outlaw them all together, uh, which we have you know yet to see you know what that's going to look like uh, as far as if there's going to be a, either the IRS is going to take away the nonprofit status and maybe the inability for for-profits to do it. The federal government could create law to, to limit that, their ability to do it. But that's the one wild card that I don't think is being talked about enough. Because we know the schools with the deep pockets are going to be the ones that, yeah, they're going to they're going to have the same amount of you know rev share that they're getting from their TV rights media deals they're sharing with the student athletes. But then it's the additional collective, the additional NIL monies that are still going to be being paid out to create that greater advantage. So, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of parity in college football in particular, in part because of the transfer portal really. 
it's a lot of good players who aren't playing somewhere else to be able to go somewhere else and start and play and help out another team. But I, I think where we're going to start to see less parity is, you know, if, if we're operating under the assumption that this rev share is going to create everyone a, a, an equal playing field or a level playing field, I, I think what happens with the collectives is, is where there could be a huge advantage for some of these schools, some of the blue buds that, that have deeper pockets. Mm. So, 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 Brady, let me ask you a question. I'm not sure if you know this, but my son is set to attend your alma mater, uh, Notre Dame. So he's we're going. Hell yeah, baby, let's go, go yeah, Irish. He's going, <laughs> yeah, he's going up on his. He's going up on his official visit, um, January. I mean June 14th. He's set to graduate high school in December and attend in January. So he asked me this question yesterday, as far as the NCAA paying athletes and, and Power Five conferences. How does this affect Notre Dame and the schools that are independent? Mm. Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll be under the exact same you know, premise. Like, usually when you hear everyone talk about how this is what's happening uh, in the Big Ten, the SEC, the athletic director, um, in this case, Pete Bavacqua, just took over for Jack Swarbrook. He's solely in those meetings. So in a lot of those meetings where you have a conference commissioner, Notre Dame always has their athletic director as part of it. And they kind of, and they really speak for not just Notre Dame. They speak for a lot of the independent schools, but also a lot of the group of five schools. You know, they were pretty heavily involved in trying to carve out space, uh, obviously for themselves to be a part of the college football playoff expansion, but also in the model that Jack Swerberg helped create for college football that we'll, we'll get this year. Uh, he wanted to make sure there's still opportunities for group of five games, where the Big Ten and the SEC – are obviously trying to jockey and fight for as many positions as possible to get more money out of it. So um, Notre Dame will be squarely a part of it all. Um, mm, it, it's, okay. that, that's not going to be an issue. They, they've got a very unique um, place in college sports. And uh, I know it sounds pompous and maybe even biased to some degree, but I think it's okay son, to be biased. Well, I was just, <laughs> as, your, as your son goes there and you get more involved too, you'll be like, oh, okay, this place is different. It, it's special. It's kind of unique. Right, oh, right, right. God. Hey, real so, simple, so, Brady. Do, do, do you like this uh, new ruling and, and what, what's going to be taking place in college football? Do you like it personally? I like it because I think it's been such a long time coming, guys. I mean, I think we all know this. You know, there, there's been a lot of people who have been huge benefactors off the backs of so many student athletes that have basically, you know, worked a job for free and, and really haven't been able to capitalize off it. I mean, I, I remember having a job. You know, back when I, was in, oh, when I was in school making seven bucks an hour, you know, it's like, you know, those days are, are long gone. These, these kids are now professionals, essentially. And we've been operating like that, yet we wouldn't want to call it that. So let's call it what it is. I mean, they're now looked at maybe not deemed to be more than a, a you know, student athlete, not as an employee, but, you know, they're essentially operating as that. So I, I think it's going to be a good ruling to get us closer to where we need to go moving forward. So it doesn't feel like it's so chaotic like it does right now and, we, we've got, you know, agents who are actually legitimate and certified and all these things that are going on outside of the college football world in particular that are just crazy. So uh, I'm, I'm happy they've gotten to this point. I just hope we can keep moving forward and progressing so this doesn't feel as crazy as it does this offseason. Does, hey, so, like, does this feel like the, the antitrust and the, the agreements – that, that are taking place in terms of settlements and the amount of money, it just seems like that is a, a, a pit. Like, it just doesn't seem like we know where the bottom of that may, may exist in terms of suits that may continue to come about. We mentioned the transfer portal. We're mentioning the, the idea of getting top players. We're, we're talking about opt-outs. Is this, was this done based out of a necessity because of what seemingly could spin out of control in terms of who's leveraging, how it's being leveraged. Because to me, now you're talking about the influence of financial advisors, the, the influence of agents. It's, it's just this is a critical mass situation to me outside of the parameters of what the schools have been able to do. Does this create the opportunity for – the systems to be put in place to resolve some of the things that may possibly challenge the, the stability of college athletics? Well, the, the settlement was born out of survival for the NCA. I mean, had this thing gone to court, they would have lost like they've lost in every single case where they've been tried. So um, that's unfortunately been the track record for the NCAA. And the, the settlement was in large part, you know, a lot less than what they would have paid 
uh, had they lost. And if they ended up going to court, I believe in January 2025, and unless it let this, you know, let them see this thing through. So um, it, it was in part for survival, but I, I do think this gets us to better frameworks for what it should look like. And again, I, I always find it interesting when we have a professional league and model that we could base a lot of things off of in regards to certifications for agents and even financial advisors. I mean, you'd have to create a union to do so, and who's going to be responsible for doing that? There's already people lining up and different coalitions lining up. But I, I kind of go back to the first point. It's not even just the NCAA's survival. I think it was the school survival, too, because mm. there is a big concern about with some of these athletic departments that had they lost out on some of these lawsuits, because it wasn't just the NCAA getting sued, it's, it's you know individual schools getting sued at times, too. But if they continue to keep losing out from these lawsuits, who knows where, where it would end? And I think that's also why you've seen um, the NCAA, a lot of the conference commissioners in particular, you know, the, the power four, if you will, continue to lobby uh, the, the federal government because they, they need someone to come in and step, step in and create guardrails around this. So this isn't just uh, you know, an endless process of ending up in court. So we create the framework of what this is going to look like. We can actually sit down at the table and say, Let's create this sort of pro model that still allows these you know, young men and women to go to school and get their degree because there is, that, that is important. Uh, but they can be compensated as well at the same time for what they're doing. So, again, I think it was born out of survival, but it is, it is going to lead us all to a much better place, I think, for the player, for the parents, um, and maybe obviously for the universities. And, and really, more than anyone else, guys, for the donors. Like mm. the NIO world right now, how it's, how it's currently working, is they need to go get a player, they go to a rich donor. And they're like, hey, man, help write the check for this. Like, that only goes right. so long. So, you know, it's even good for the alumni networks that have been tapped out right now funding their football and basketball and baseball and lacrosse right. teams right now as Notre Dame's playing in the Final Four. So, I mean, all, all these, all these the alumni are just tapped out at this point. Hey, Brady, so real quick, speaking about uh, – uh, TJ said pitfalls. You, t- you were talking about lawsuits, lawsuits. I'm not sure if you're up on this Shiloh Sanders thing with him. Uh, being sued for like $12 million, losing a lawsuit, and then declaring bankruptcy on his NIL money. Can you, uh, can you, can you give us uh, uh, what you know about, about the situation? I, I don't know much about it. I did see in the news, but, again, I, I'd have to look through some of the financial right. docs. But, I mean, look, bankruptcy, I think, gets, um, you know, gets misconstrued sometimes. You know, a lot of people think, oh, bankrupt, this guy's out of money. No, sometimes they're just reorganizing their debt, Right. There's right. a difference between bankruptcy for Chapter 7 and Chapter 11. And I think in this case, you know, it, it hopefully will pri- provide an example maybe for some other guys out there. Because um, it's not just the Shiloh Sanders example. I mean, you look at Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, Var and I have been talking about this probably for the past week. And just guys who, you know, have deals that they sign and, and they don't realize, you know, the term sheet that they're agreeing to and what that means moving forward. Um, so hopefully it's, it's, a, it's a more of a warning sign. No, right. no, it's it's not more of a it's not more of a learning sign. It's it's more it's it's uh him being sued by him basically these young kids being targets and not understanding that they're targets and the money that they're having of him uh, breaking the neck of a high school security guard in 2015 and he comes back and sues him and wins right. 12 million dollars in a lawsuit. Right, and, and look again, I don't know the specifics of, of all that, how that worked out, but that's that's the case for anyone with money, right? I mean, yes. now that you've got money, it's like they're learning, yeah, we're, you're a target of everything you do. And so it's, you know, these kids are going to have to grow up quick. I and mean, that's, that's the truth of the matter. It's unfortunate, you know, all that, that's, all that stuff transpired in the past and someone's able to, what, nine years later, do to file a right. lawsuit now. When he, when um, he was a kid. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm. Which, again, I mean, you know, you'd think that they would be able to take that in, into consideration, um, you know, when they're making that judgment, but – yeah, I, I haven't read up enough on it, but it, it's again, it, it's it's an example of what's happening right now for a lot of these, you know, young men and women. They're they're and even some of the young women who have been making a ton of money and they get all the same that goes along with it. Well, there's a lot of other stuff that comes on the side too with the attention they get, and that's that's been hard, I think, for a lot of them to deal with the additional attention they get. Caden Clark's one of the first that kind of comes to mind um, in regards to a lot of love, some hate, and and, and everything in between. Um, in regards to her fame, that's all kind of come out from, from NIL and her success in the college, college realm. That's Brady Quinn of Two Pros and a Cup of Joe, my guy. 
my baby bro. He always brings his A game, as you can see. If you want to catch more of him, all you got to do is tune in Monday through Friday, super early, 9, you know, what was 6 a.m. on the East Coast, 3 a.m. on the West Coast. But we, we stay on for three hours just putting all this game up in your ear like we just did. So it was great bringing the two, two uh, shows together. This, this was long awaited, long coming, long time coming. Appreciate you coming on, Q. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, appreciate you all, and then obviously have a have a wonderful weekend. But let's not forget what this weekend's all about. Indeed, day, all those brave men and women who sacrificed made the ultimate sacrifice for us. So appreciate Indeed. you guys. Enjoy your weekend, my guy. Talk to you on Tuesday. That's Brady Quinn.